ATD Financial Literacy Workshop Series brought to you by TD Bank and the great SBDC up in my area, uh, in, in the Tampa area, and of course, the United States Small Business Administration. I am CJ Castro. I'm Sam for the, the Tam, Tampa area and also the uh, Lender Relationship Specialist for South Florida. Joining me today is Bill Burnham from the SBDC and Castillas, Evis Monzo from TD Bank, and, um, and I think that's it. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Please note that this is an educational session and not for uh, 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 um, attribution. Report Reporters can contact the closest district office for an interview in the event of any consistencies between this presentation and any official guidance yeah. released. The official that's guidance true. governs. Let us go that's over a few housekeeping house items. Uh, just a minute, please keep yourself muted um, while, while others are, are speaking. Uh, but here, let's go over a few housekeeping items uh, to get started. If you have any technical dif difficulties or issues seeing the slides, try to exit your current browser and re-enter using Microsoft Edge. During the presentation, you can submit your questions in the chat and you will answer and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. A PDF of the slides will be emailed to you by the end of the day. Please remember these are for personal use only. We hope you enjoy this training and connect with us through email and social media. We'll provide you contact at the end of the presentation. And right now I'd like to introduce our, dist our Deputy District Director, Althea Harris, say a few words. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? No. <laughs> OK, so well, that, that that may be considered a plus. All right, well, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, my voice does work and I am delighted to be with you all today. Thank you so much, CJ, for uh, putting this event together and for our friends at the Small Business Development Center and TD Bank. Um, this is an exciting time, my friends, to be in business or even want to be in business. Next week is National Small Business Week, where we celebrate business owners and entrepreneurs who uh, you know, have the grit and determination, the courage to start a business, create their own jobs and create jobs for others so that they can feed their families and send their kids to college if that's what they want to do. So I want to thank you uh, for being here today and encourage you to listen up and listen in. But don't just be a person who hears, do something with what you hear today, right? Apply what you learn today. I mean, the business plan is the foundation of a strong business that you're going to launch from your business plan. And so you're in the teams as you hire people and you have employees, you're going to um, be showing them the way with your business plan, where you want to take this enterprise and the impact that you want it to have, not only on your own life, on the lives of your employees, on the lives of your customers, but ultimately on uh, the nation's economy. Small business owners uh, represent two thirds of all net new job creators. You're over 99% of all businesses in America. When you do well, we all do well. So it's really imperative that you start well. And so that's what today is about. So I thank you for being here. I encourage you, uh, as I said, to listen in and apply what you hear. So thanks so much, CJ, for pulling this all together. Thank you for our guests who will be on today. And thank you uh, for the audience. I appreciate you. And if there's anything that we can do here in the South Florida District Office, the U.S. Small Business Administration, I hope you'll reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Althea. And Bill, you're up next. All right. Uh, thank you, CJ. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, everyone should be seeing the screen that says developing a strong business plan at this point. And if you can just make sure that you're muted if you're on so that we're not getting any feedback. All right, so I always like to start out, well, I'm going to do a little bit of a commercial. I am with the uh, Florida SBDC, uh, the uh, SBDC at USF specifically in the in the Tampa Bay area. 
So uh, we locally like to invite uh, folks to be connected with us. We're on all the social media channels, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and so forth. So get connected with us. You get lots of good information, find out what's going on uh, in the area, of business trends. We put out emergency notifications. We also have a monthly newsletter, uh, which keeps you informed on upcoming events. So we invite you to do that. For those of you who are not familiar with the SBDC, we'll spend just a minute on that. We do provide no-cost training, confidential no-cost consulting, market research, and other things for small business owners and those who want to be small business owners. We cover all the areas that are, that are shown on this slide. Uh, locally here, we cover the 10 counties uh, around the Tampa Bay area that are listed at the bottom of the slide. I would, however, say uh, that for those of you who may not be uh, in the Tampa market, uh, the state of Florida uh, has a very strong uh, SBDC network that operates throughout the state, and the SBDC is also a nationwide network. So if you're outside the state of Florida, uh, there is a local SBDC office not too far away from you. We are a resource partner of the S uh, SBA. Uh, we do get funding from the SBA as well as as well as the state of Florida and some of our local uh, partners, counties, and cities that allow us to offer our services at no cost to you, the business owner. Just a little bit about me. My name is Bill Burnham. I am a business consultant with the Florida SBDC at USF. I've been with the SBDC for seven years. Prior to that, I was a small business owner for about a dozen years. Uh, in a number of different ventures, including dry cleaning. I owned a dry cleaning business at one point, also owned a home health agency at one point, uh, sold those businesses off and, and uh, came to work at the SBDC in uh, 2016. Have uh, spent some time working as a business broker, helping people buy and sell businesses. Uh, areas that I concentrate in are obviously business plans that we're gonna be talking about today financial forecasting, cash flow management, capital access, business acquisition, uh, uh, and exit planning are just a few of the things that, that I focus on in my job. All right, so our goal today by presenting this presentation are really two things that I hope to accomplish. One is to give you some practical information on writing your business plan. And I highlighted your there because I, I think it's really important. In my time, I've, I've looked at hundreds of business plans and sometimes individuals will pay somebody to do a business plan for them. I have found over the years that those plans typically aren't all that good. They aren't meaningful to the business owner. Uh, and then and, and because of that, they don't serve the purpose that, that they need to serve for the business owner. Uh, I also hope that through this uh, presentation, we'll reduce what I call the business plan anxiety. Um, statistically, I think it's pretty well known that, that most people, the top two things they fear are death and public speaking. Uh, number three, I believe, is probably writing a business plan. So hopefully we can reduce some of that anxiety with, with the information that we'll share today. So why would we do a business plan? Uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, that, that we would do a business plan. Um, I believe that it helps us validate the opportunity. We, every business idea starts with a perceived opportunity. Uh, to solve a problem of some sort. Uh, going through this business plan uh, process will help us validate that that opportunity is really a good business idea. If we do it properly, it'll challenge all aspects of what we're going to do. It'll help us in organizing our effort, efforts and focusing our efforts. It will serve as a foundation, as Althea mentioned at the top, at the very beginning of your business, a business plan really does serve as the foundation for everything you're going to do moving forward. I believe that it's, it should be a living document that you uh, reevaluate at least once a year to see how things have changed in your business and kind of run those changes back through your business plan. I also believe that if, if you are anticipating major changes in your business, that you run those changes through your business plan just to see what the impact on the overall business might be and how you need to, 
to uh, change things perhaps. Uh, in, in many cases, a business plan is going to be reti uh, required for financing. Um, and I know TD Bank is, is on and will be giving some information out a little bit later on that. But uh, in my experience, in, in most cases, uh, a lender is going to want to see a business plan that will include a financial forecast uh, before they would be willing to lend money to you. Uh, and statistically, studies have been done that show that if you start a business with a business plan, your uh, odds of success increase. Most people have heard the statistics that 80% of small businesses fail within five years. Um, studies have shown that uh, your odds of success improve by 60% if you start with a business plan. So. Uh, all of those are, are, I think, great reasons to, to do a business plan. Okay, so here's some of the topics we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk a little bit about prep, preparation, and then we'll get into kind of the, the functional aspect of a business plan and look at defining opportunity and talking about execution and, and so forth. Uh, we'll go through each of those areas in, in detail. All right, let's talk a little bit about preparation. So there's, um, I think when we start uh, preparing to do a business plan, a lot of us just want to rush right in and start, you know, putting uh, pen to paper or start typing into the computer. Uh, all these, all, all these random thoughts about what our business is going to be. In reality, what we should be doing before we put the first word down in the business plan is a lot of research, okay? Because we're going to need a lot of information to go into this business plan uh, in order for it to, to uh, be constructed properly. So we're going to need to do industry research um, where we might want to know how big the industry is, what kind of trends are going on in the industry, is it growing, is it declining, are there some specific issues out there that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> The market, uh, really critical anytime you're doing a business plan is to, to have a, a really strong handle on what your market is, who your target client is, how big they are, where they are, why do they buy, why would they buy from you. All of that is critical information that we can get by doing research on our market. Uh, we're going to need to know something about the competition. Uh, every business, I, you know, I've been doing this for seven years, looked at hundreds of business plans over that time, worked with thousands of business owners, and I've yet to come across a business that didn't have some form of competition. Um, there's a tendency for small business owners to minimize what the competition uh, really is. Um, and I think a lot of times that can be a mistake, but we want to understand who they are. We want to understand their strengths and weaknesses. In some cases, we want to look at what they're doing and see if they're doing some things that we might want to imitate. Um, so definitely have to study the competition. It's going to have an impact on how much of the market we are going to be able to actually capture. If your business is location dependent, we need to do some research on that, understanding costs, traffic patterns, parking, accessibility, how big is the accessible market? What does the surrounding area look like? Is it conducive to the business? Are there, are there complementary businesses in the area? That kind of thing. Uh, pricing, we're going to have to have a pricing strategy. How are we going to price? There's a lots of, lot of different strategies uh, when it comes to pricing. Uh, we're not going to talk about those today. Uh, you know, I'll say if you're interested in some of those, get a hold of us at the SBDC and we can explore some of those uh, strategies in, in more detail. We're going to have to promote our business. Uh, we need to address that in our business plan. What are we going to do to make people aware that we're even out there? How are we going to generate leads? How are we going to create sales? All of that happens through promotion uh, of, of various kinds. Uh, and then the big one that always always is is out there is finances. Um, you know, it's going to take uh, capital to start any business. Obviously, some businesses more than others, but a capital uh, is always going to be required. Uh, so we need to know how much do we need that there's going to be research involved in figuring that out. 
we're going to have to figure out where it's going to come from. You know, are we going to be able to get a loan? How much are we going to have to contribute? How much is it going to cost us to to get a loan if if we're able to get a, a loan? Um, what's the revenue stream going to look like? What are the revenue streams going to be? Uh, and what are the expenses that are going to be associated with generating that revenue? All of that comes through research uh, that should be done, again, prior to putting uh, pen to paper or typing in the first word uh, into a Word document as you, <laughs> excuse me, create your business plan. All right, so having done all that research and, and spent uh, you know, numerous hours doing that, maybe interacting with, with resources like the, the SBDC uh, to help you with, with those things, uh, now we're ready to start uh, actually formulating our business plan. So we're kind of going to go through um, a format of a business plan and look at what are some of the things that should be covered in that in each section of the business plan. I will say that uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on the format. Uh, the format we're going to go through here today is just one of probably hundreds of different formats. My suggestion to you there is, is find a format that you like, that you feel comfortable working in, that's easy for you to kind of organize your uh, thoughts and, and get things flowing and, and use that. As long as the, all the information is there, the format uh, is, is not going to be uh, critical. All right, so the executive summary. The executive summary is going to be the first thing a reader sees when they open your business plan. Uh, it is a summary, so it should be no more than, you know, three to five pages, depending on your business. Um, it's a summary of everything that's in the business plan. We recommend that the executive summary is the, the last thing you write in your business plan, that you've got all the detail and all the sections, and then you, you go through that detailed plan and you pull data from that to create the executive summary. So what are we going to do? What are we going to say in the executive summary? Well, we're going to talk about and describe what is the business opportunity that that the plan uh, is is focused on. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, you know, is it something new to the market? Is it an improvement to an existing product? What is it that we're actually addressing? We're going to talk about a mar the market. You know, who is our ideal client? in a very summarized way, how big we think that market is. We're going to talk about why we're the best solution, uh, what our solution is, and why it's better than what the competition is. Again, at a very high level, just a little bit of information on the competitors, how many there are, that type of thing. Uh, we'll get into detail on competition in, in the narrative of the plan itself. Then we're going to talk about expectations, and that's where our forecast is going to come in. At a high level, here's what we expect to do in revenue over the first three years. Here's what we expect the profitability to be uh, on the in the business over the first three years. We'll talk about how much financing we're going to need. You know, what is the total project cost involved to get this business off the ground or to add you know, an, another location to an existing business, a new product line to an existing business. What is the total amount of money needed? And then where is it going to come from? What are our assumptions about how much we're going to contribute as business owners? And how much are we hoping to be able to get in the way of financing from, from a lender? And what are the assumptions we're making about that loan in terms of what is the interest rate going to be? What is the term of the loan going to be? And then we'll put in some information on some financial highlights per year. When, for example, do we first uh, achieve break even? Uh, what does cash flow look like by the end of year one? At, at what point do we reach our target profitability? Just some highlights that we would put in, in the executive summary. Remember, we want to make that. We want to write it last and we want it to be something that really will grab the reader's attention. It might be the only thing the reader ever looks at. Uh, and so if we don't make it worthwhile to where they want to delve into the rest of the plan, they may never get the opportunity or may, may never take the opportunity 
to read all the details that you have in that plan. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the opportunity. And that's really the problem we're trying to solve by creating this business or adding a new product or service, whatever the case might be. So what is that product or service? What is a what is the uh, kind of a competitive analysis? Who else is out there doing? What are they doing? Uh, how is our product different? Uh, who are the suppliers that we're going to depend on? If we have suppliers that we're going to depend on, um, is there a level of inventory we're going to need, and, and what is that, and and how much? Um, if your product or service is not mature yet. Uh, there may be some research and development that still needs to be uh, conducted. We should identify what that is. All right, the target market. Um, again, I said this a minute ago, critical, critical, critical that we understand the market. All right, um, we need to know how big the market is our market, not the overall market, but our specific market, how big is it? Are there specific segments to our market? For example, are we strictly selling to a con the consumer or are we also maybe selling to the consumer, but our product also can be uh, sold to businesses? So we can also op operate in a B2B uh, type of market. Uh, perhaps we can also operate in a, a B2G or, or, biz, or business to government market. So what are those segments? Uh, how bigger is each segment? Uh, and what is the customer profile for each segment? So in, we want to describe in as much detail as possible uh, the characteristics of our target client. So that might be some demographic information, uh, could be age, it could be marital status, could be where they live geographically. There's just almost an endless uh, number of characteristics that you could use to create a, a customer profile. And, and the goal really is to come up with a descriptor that describes about 80% of your, your target market. Uh, there's always going to be those outliers that buy your product that don't fit what the profile is, uh, but we're really trying to describe about 80% so that we can develop a marketing plan that speaks to that 80%. I mentioned competition a minute ago. Uh, we'll have a, a detailed section on competition. We'll talk about what the current alternatives are. Uh, in the market, who our primary competitors are. I typically like to focus on somewhere between three and five primary competitors. You know, depending on your industry, there could be literally hundreds of competitors that are, you know, if you think of a, a, an industry like the, the hospitality industry, restaurant industry, um, depending on the location you're in, there could literally be hundreds of uh, restaurants all competing for the same general target market. So, but we're going to focus on three to five that we feel are the, the highest uh, ranked competitors. Uh, and then I like to put together a table that lists some key factors uh, that we think are important to success in that business, and then rank ourselves and the competitors in each of those key factors. And it doesn't have to be, you know, 25 factors or anything like that. It can be five, six factors that you think are really important uh, and honestly rank uh, what you think uh, the competitors, how the competitors score. It could be a scale of one to five or one to 10 um, and how you rank against them. And then we're gonna look at some uh, strengths and weaknesses of our competitors, what do they do really well that we might want to uh, imitate? What do they do poorly that we might want to take advantage of in terms of our marketing and really stressing how maybe it's customer service in, in your research, you found that some of your competitors really don't uh, do well with customer service. You can you know go and actually 
visit their place and, and get some firsthand information, get online and look at some reviews and see what people are complaining about. Might give you an idea of some of their weaknesses that you can then build a marketing strategy around of, of attacking those weaknesses. Okay, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna do some research on, on the industry. Uh, in the business plan, we wanna talk a little bit about the industry. What, in general, what is it? How big is it in terms of total sales, say in the US? Uh, we might break that down and say, okay, US is a billion dollars. State of Florida is $500 million. Tampa Bay area where we happen to be is, you know, 20 million, whatever the case might be. We want to look at maybe projected growth rates for the industry over the next five years. Ideally, if we're looking to get into a, a specific industry, we want, we want it to be an industry that's growing, not declining. We want to look at to see if there's any trends in that industry that we should be aware of. Is, does the industry have a seasonal component to it? Uh, if they if it does, it's good that we know that so we can reflect that in our financial data. Seasonality definitely affects uh, the finances. It affects cash flow. Uh, we need to know that. We might look at uh, what industry trade shows are out there and identify some opportunities that exist in the, in the industry, as well as some threats that, that might be out there that we need to be aware of as we move forward into the future. Okay, let's talk now a little bit about execution. Um, the, up to now, we've, we've kind of dealt with some background information. Now we're going to talk about how we're actually going to execute uh, this business. So uh, we're going to put together a marketing plan. Uh, in our marketing plan, we're going to talk about, again, what is our competitive advantage? We're going to talk about Again, I mentioned earlier in the research area how we were going to research our uh, what methodologies we might use or strategies we might use for pricing. Uh, you know, if you look at say in in the grocery industry, if I uh, say Walmart, everybody knows that uh, Walmart's pricing strategy is to be the low cost leader. Um, if I say Publix, everybody knows Publix isn't necessarily concerned about being the low cost provider of, of groceries. They focus more on customer service, knowing that their uh, or their belief is that their customers will pay a little bit more um, in, in terms of the cost uh, because they want that higher level of customer service, perhaps. How is our product going to be distributed? Uh, are we going to have brick and mortar? Are we going to be online? If we're going to be online, are we going to have our own website? Are we going to sell on Amazon, Etsy, you know, one of those sites? What are the distribution channels going to be? I mentioned earlier the promotional plan. What tactics are we going to use to create awareness, generate leads, and convert those leads into sales? There's again, there's all sorts of different promotional things you can do. Uh, you know, think of uh, promotional where we think of advertising and marketing. That's really what that is. Um, we need to have a strategy and a plan for that. And it needs to be laid out here in our business plan. And we need to have um, a system identified on how we are going to get feedback from our, our customers. Um, Certainly today, a lot of, uh, if it's a consumer-based uh, market that you're after, everybody looks online to see what the reviews are. You know, no matter what the product is, you can thank Amazon, I think, for that. Uh, everybody looks to see what the online reviews are, and they, they factor that in into making our decision. That's a form of feedback. Um, if, if you're not online, if you're not selling online, you need to have some sort of methodology for gathering customer feedback. At the SBDC, we uh, get feedback from our clients in several ways. We have a, when the first time we meet with somebody, we send them a short survey via email to answer. If we do a, a training session like this, we would have them do an evaluation of the training at the end of the, uh, the seminar so we could gather data on what they like, what they didn't like. Once a year, we do an annual survey uh, that's put out by our state office to gather information on, on our clients and what they think about the service that we've provided them. It's really important to do that. It allows you, if there are negative things that are going on, it gives you a heads up to, as to what those are so that you can take corrective action before they get out of hand. 
Um, and if it's positive, great. That's marketing material that you can use on your website, on your social media sites uh, in the way of testimonials and whatnot. So definitely plan for having uh, a feedback mechanism uh, as part of your business plan. Sales plan, sales is a little different from marketing. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to go through a sales process depending on what our uh, business is going to be. Um, we're going to have strategies that, as I said earlier, that we're going to use to create this pre-purchase disposition, if you will. Uh, we need to have a budget for that. Uh, it costs money to do all that kind of thing, so we need to understand what those costs might actually be. Um, if there's a, a, an extended sales process, we need to explain that so that we can show ourselves and the reader that we know what that process is. Um, and you know, some components I've listed here on this slide, you know, we identify the prospect, um, we have a, a process for generating leads, uh, we have a, a methodology of contact uh, for that client. Uh, we know how long the sales cycle is uh, from the time we initially make contact until we actually book a sales uh, a sale. Uh, we have some sales goals, which I highly recommend. Of course, that'll be part of your forecast um, is establishing what what your goals are going to be, um, and then you know kind of filter the, filtering them down to all levels of the organization. And then some tracking mechanisms. How are we going to measure ourselves to make sure that we're attaining our sales goals? All right, in the way of operations, um, we need to describe if, again, if we're going to have a brick and mortar location, we need to describe what that location looks like pictures, maps, floor plans are always great uh, to put into your business plan. Doesn't have to be all text. Um, I want to talk about why we selected the specific location that we did. We talk, we describe the facility. What really, what does it look like? What is it, how many square feet? You know, how much is office space? How much is warehouse space? That kind of thing. Uh, if we have technology requirements, we want to describe those. Uh, you know, what's our point of sale system? What's our inventory tracking system? Uh, all those kind of things we would describe in, in our operations portion of our plan. If we have some equipment and tools that are unique that we're going to need, um, several years ago, I helped a dentist who wanted to go out on her own and start her own practice. So part of her plan was obviously she had to have a location and facilities. What was the building? Her In her case, she was building the building from the ground up. So we had detailed plans. We, you know, in, a, in our appendix, which we'll talk about later, we had construction quotes and all that. We had a detailed list of all the equipment and tools that were going to be involved or that were going to be needed for uh, her in that to operate that dental practice. So those are the types of things you need to consider. And then who are who are going to be our suppliers? You know, again, if we're if we're talking about uh, uh, an inventory type situation where we're buying product and, and maybe improving it and then reselling it, or whether we're just buying merchandise and then reselling it, uh, typical retail. Who are our major suppliers and who are our backup suppliers? What kind of terms do we have with them? All those kind of things we would describe in the operations. Uh, section of the business plan. We should have some milestones and metrics identified. Yeah, I touched a minute ago on uh, business goals. Uh, I think that's really critically important. If you don't, if your business doesn't have any goals, uh, you're just going to kind of aimlessly wander around. Uh, you, you know, you'll never know if you actually arrive if you don't have a goal on where you want to get to. Uh, I'm sure probably most everybody's heard of, of the term the SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and have time frames associated with them. Um, so identify some business goals that you have near term and long term. 
try to identify what you think the keys to the success in this particular business are. Talk about future plans. Um, what are some key metrics that you're going to be measuring? Your KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, some things that you feel are really critical uh, to ultimately get uh, attaining the goals that you uh, want to achieve. Okay, so we'll talk then a little bit about the company itself. Um, we'll talk about the ownership and the structure. So who are the owners of the company? If there are multiple owners, we'll describe each one of them, talk about some a little bit about their backgrounds. The appendix would actually have resumes of, of the, uh, for each of the owners uh, included. Uh, you know, what are their strengths? What, what's their experience? What roles are they going to have in the company? You know, what are they going to be responsible for? How much of an ownership stake do they each have? You know, what percent of ownership do they have? We want to talk just a little bit about uh, what the company's legal structure is in the state of Florida where we are. You have several options uh, in terms of your legal structure. You could be a sole proprietor, partnership, uh, an LLC, or a corporation. And within the corporation, there's some tax variations on S or C. So we might talk about uh, what is the structure that we've chosen uh, and why we chose it. You know, what what was the the, the uh, kind of the main reasons? Say we chose to be an LLC over a partnership, perhaps. talk a little bit about the team. Uh, you know, if we have a, a, a management team or some key team members, we want to, if they're known at the time that we're uh, putting the plan together, we would actually list who they are. And again, just like we did with the, with the owners, we list their backgrounds, what their qualifications are, their experience, and so forth. Um, if they're not known, then you just list the key positions that you think are, are important um, and what kind of uh, qualifications and background you're going to be looking for, what, what kind of experience uh, and skills do they need to have in order to fill what you see as those key positions. And then I think it's important to also list uh, who your key advisors are. So in the, in the advisor category, uh, I would have things like who is your business attorney? Who is your CPA or accountant? Who is your business banker? Um, who is your insurance person for your business? Uh, if you're working with the SBDC, uh, you may list an SBDC consultant that you've worked with, or if you're working with some outside consultant that's assisted you in this process, you might also list them there as well. Those are key advisors that'll be able to help you over not just at the beginning stages of your business, but over the entire life cycle of your business. Uh, you know, when it comes to business bankers, it's nice to be able to go to your banker and talk about issues that you're having and get get their support, get their feedback from a banking perspective uh, on what's going on in your business. So um, ideally, again, you wanna have at least those uh, advisors on your team. Okay, big part of your business plan is going to be the financial plan, the financial forecast. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit up front, but uh, just in a little bit more detail, uh, what's going to be expected here? It does vary if you're if you're in the uh, uh, process of putting together a business plan for uh, financing purposes, uh, the expectations of the lender, may vary a little bit from lender to lender. Uh, so what I'm going to describe here is just kind of a generic uh, uh, set of circumstances that that I've seen over the years that I've been doing this. So we're going to uh, identify what our assumptions are uh, in, in terms of uh, we put together a forecast. What did we assume? What was the basis for uh, the information that we're going to be providing. Did we use some industry standards? Did we have some historical data? Were we using benchmarks? Did we go out and actually get quotes on things? Uh, and it's probably going to be a combination of all of those things. Uh, but it's important that you identify how you put 
the forecast together. You know, what was the basis for the forecast? It isn't just numbers we made up. We actually had a logical basis for how we put this together. Um, on the income side, we're going to look at what's the demand for our product, obviously. Uh, we're going to look at the competition. That involves, again, the market, all that research that we've done. Uh, you know, if, we, if there's 10 competitors, uh, we cannot expect that we're going to get 100% of the available market. You know, we're only going to be uh, able to get our whatever our fair share of that market happens to be. That intelligence needs to be uh, plugged into your income projections. Uh, on the ex expense side, again, we may be looking at uh, what we call peer group comparisons. That would be benchmarking. We may have some historical data we can draw on. Again, we may actually go out and get quotes. We'll call, you know, call the power company, call a telephone company, see how much it's going to cost. We'll, we'll get an estimate on a point of sale system, all that kind of thing. The cost side is typically the easiest part of the forecast. Uh, the more difficult part is, is typically forecasting revenue. Uh, what are we going to be looking to see? Well, we're going to be looking to see an income statement that covers at least two years. In some cases, some lenders like to see the first three years. Uh, my experience has been that that uh, we would uh, have the first month of our or the first year of our income statement would be a month by month. So we show 12 months of, of what the business is going to do each month, revenue coming in, expenses, uh, net profit or loss for each of the first 12 months. And then years two and three, if necessary, maybe in a in a summary format where we're not listing each month. We, we're going to show a cash flow statement, which again covers at least two, maybe three years. Um, first year, again, month by month, so we can see what what cash flow looks like uh, in each month, uh, and what our cash balance is going to be at the end of each month uh, for that first year, and then years two and three. In a in a in a summary format, we're going to show a balance sheet. Uh, you know, what does our balance sheet look like at the end of year one? What does it look like at the end of year two? Again, perhaps uh, year three, if if necessary, as well. Balance sheet lists all the assets of the company, liabilities, uh, and uh, the equity or net worth. So what we own against what we owe. What's left over is is the equity or net worth uh, in that in that business. All right, um, we're going to have an appendix in our business plan. The appendix uh, this uh, this this is a list of some of the things we would put in in the appendix. Um, it may, uh, depending on your business, where your business is in in the life cycle of a business. Some of this uh, may not be relevant uh, to you. But this again, this is kind of a generic list. You know, monthly uh, financial statements. We'd identify what the the break even for our business is. We'd have a break even chart. Might have might need a personal financial statement, which is like you as the business owner. What does your balance sheet look like? Uh, if we're an existing business, we might show some historical financial statements. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mentioned the equipment list earlier when I was talking about the example of the dentist that I helped. You know, she had that that big old long list of all the equipment with pricing that uh, was going to be required for her business. That was that list was actually in the appendix. Construction quotes if we're building from the ground up, or if we're doing you know we're leasing a building and we have leasehold improvements. Uh, we're going to need to have quotes on that, and we should have those quotes included in our business plan in the appendix. I talked about the resumes already, um, and then you know, again, if you're an existing business, you may have some advertising materials, uh, you know, customer testimonials, and and that kind of thing. And I think that's that's it. Um, you know, that's kind of a very quick uh, run yeah, through this. Yes. Um, uh, but I'll, but, uh, I'll open it up. I don't know, CJ, if now is the appropriate time for questions or we'll wait to the end to do that. Uh, thank you, Bill. I think we'll wait for the end. I don't have any questions in the chat yet, but right, let's sure. let's keep on going. You did a great job. Um, Anna and Evis, you're up Hi. next. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining today. 
I am Evie Smosan, commercial lender for TD Bank, America's most convenient bank, and I specialize in helping small business owners obtain quick access to capital. Believe it or not, I've been in banking for over 20 years, and with TD Bank, 13 years in counting. Thank you, William, for the incredible presentation. It was very valuable and thorough. I am certain we have all gained some new insights and perspectives from your expertise, so thank you. I want to go over why a business plan is important for a lender to review, but also go over the five C's of credits and how they go hand in hand. Bankers, can, you know, banks consider it is important for businesses to have a well-structured business plan for several reasons. First, it provides with a clear understanding of the business model and its potential for success. This allows them to assess the risk and potential rewards <clears throat> of investing, <clears throat> excuse me, in the business. Second, a business plan shows the bank that the business owner has thought through the various aspects of the business, including marketing, as William mentioned, operations and financials, which increases their confidence in the business ability to succeed. A business plan also serves as a roadmap for the business owner, providing a clear vision and direction for the business. It essentially helps tell a story. It helps to identify potential problems and opportunities and provides a framework for decision making. Additionally, having a well-structured business plan is often a requirement, in particular for startup companies, for obtaining funding <clears throat> from banks and other institutions. It demonstrates, it demonstrates to the lender that the business owner is serious about their about business and has taken the time to plan for its success. Okay, so I want to talk to you about how does a business plan help you access capital and how do banks evaluate that? When, when we're reviewing a loan package, banks still look at, if you're unfamiliar with, the five C's of credits. Okay. The five C's of credits are a framework that lenders use to evaluate the credit worthiness of a borrower. The five C's of credits are character. We're going to go over these in more detail. Capacity. Capital collateral and conditions. Together, these serve as a way for lenders to evaluate the credit worthiness of a potential borrower. Note that both personal and business credit scores play an important role in a lender's evaluation of your overall credit worthiness. So let's go over each of them together. When we're looking at character, banks, you know, what we're looking at is important to, for a bank to have a significant comfort with the character of its prospective borrower. This refers to the borrower's reputation, honesty, and reliability in fulfilling the, their financial obligations. Banks analyze by pulling personal and business credit reports to see how credit is being managed. Credit report goes beyond just your credit score. So some people ask me, you know, well, what credit score is it that you know you guys look at? We, we really dig deep into the into the credit report. Lenders use it as a reference. I like to use the example of think of your credit report as your report card. It measures the integrity of the borrower's you know, ability to manage credit. As in school, you check your report card, your grades quarterly. At minimum, you should be checking your credit report annually. When a lender pulls your credit, as I mentioned, we're not just looking at your credit score. They can see identifying information such as your trade lines, meaning how many you know, uh, established accounts you have, how many credit inquiries have been pulled on your credit. Those really do affect. So when you're out there shopping around and you're pulling to see if you can get financing here or there, every pull does affect your credit. Public records, accounts and collections, bankruptcy we see. The credit report also shows things as the different um, type of credit that you that you use, the length of time your account has been established, and whether or not you're paying your bills on time. Information like this adds to the layers the lenders review when making conclusions about your credit worthiness. Business reports have you know credit as well, and they're pulled through Dun and Brad's. Your employment history and personal financial strengths are also helpful tools that we use to kind of gauge on character. The next one is capacity. And capacity determines whether or not the customer has the ability to repay the loan and or its current you know, debt obligations. Lenders determine 
a customer's capacity by analyzing historical financials, trends and ratios, and testing the business liquidity and cash flow. Capacity is considered the most important factor in a business credit decision. Ultimately, it measures how much credit a borrower is able to handle. So character, capacity, and now in addition, personal guarantees. Every loan that a bank makes will require a personal guarantee, which is a legal promise to pay credit issued to a business for which they serve as an owner and lenders will take that into consideration. For small business loans, we look at global. So we will look at both your personal and business income and debt and the business's income and debt when we're considering you know, your debt service coverage ratio. We look at both. The other item on the list is capital. I like to call this you know, skin in the game. Capital is a measure of the borrower's investment in the business shows the amount of money the owners have invested in the business and an analysis of available source of cash and other personal assets outside of the business will also be completed. This helps to determine the borrower's ability to overcome financial obligations and difficulties. Capital is measured in cash liquidity, equity and fixed assets or retained earnings. Banks are generally more favorable to requests where owners have skin in the game meaning they have injected their own funds. It shows that they, they too believe in their business. And the next one is collateral. Collateral is what borrows pledge to secure financing for a loan. Collateral is considered a secondary, not first, it's a secondary source of repayment. In the event the business cash flow fails to do so, businesses and personal assets are evaluated to determine sufficient collateral, collateral coverage on any loan size. Types of collateral include equipment, account receivables, real estate property, vehicles, and inventory. But again, the collateral is just a secondary source of repayment. It is not meant to be the first repayment of the loan. And the last um, character in the, in the five C's of credit is condition. And the condition assesses the current economic conditions and industry trends that can impact the borrower's ability to repay the loan. Lenders will evaluate the condition of the borrower's industry. So as well, it's really important, as William mentioned, that you do a lot of research in the industry that you're going into, as well as general economic conditions to determine the level of risk involved in lending money to the borrower. For example, if the borrower operates in an industry that is experiencing a downturn or is highly competitive, the lender may consider this a high risk loan. On the other hand, if the borrower operates in a growing industry and stable, but the economy is strong and thriving, then this may be considered a lower risk loan. Conditions ultimately help lenders assess the overall economic environment the borrower operates and how they impact their ability to repay the loan. So all the five C's of credit is really build a framework around how the bank makes their decision when you know extending credit along with the business plan. These business templates that you see here, there's, there's two different types. You have your traditional business plan and you have your lean startup business plan. The traditional business plan is the one that William went over with you today. And I think that one is um, by far the best one you know, to really invest your time in if you're really looking to make an impact. It does consume a lot of time, um, but it is well worth the investment. The lean startup plan um, could be for much, much smaller companies that are not looking um, for really large financing, but it, it's, it's a good way to start. But um, the traditional business plan is definitely, I think, the way to go. And I think um, the links will be provided to you guys after the event. All of these um, business plan components, William went over with you <clears throat> just a few minutes ago, but I'll just go over and brief. The executive summary provides an overview of the key points, you know, allowing readers to quickly understand. The products and service, you know, this one, uh, it's a brief description of the goods and services that the company is going to be providing. The market is an overview of the industry and the market in which the company operates. The marketing strategy should have outlined the approach company takes to take target and capture specific market segments. In competition, which he also mentions and analyzes of other companies or businesses that are offering similar products or services to the target market. 
and operations provides a detailed description of how the business functions on a day-to-day -day basis. And team management is the overview of individuals responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operate, operating and businesses. Resumes are usually required. Personnel helps investors, you know, lenders evaluate the capability of the team and their ability to um, successfully execute on the business plan. Financial data provides comprehensive overview of the financial health and viability of the business. It includes projections for the next three years, or uh, even up to five. And supporting documentation is the purpose to provide you know, additional information that can be validated through the business plan assumptions and projections and strategies. So those are just some of the things. And the executive summary, I think, you know, um, he'll probably go more into depth with that, but it pretty much covers, you know, how the executive summary should read. What I did want to spend some time and probably in, in this moment to tell you is that before I turn it over to Anna is TD Bank, we offer different types of lending for small business owners, both starting up an already current business or looking to grow. Some of the, you know, credits that we extend is working capital. This would be through a line of credit. And lines of credits can be used, you know, to fund account receivables if you're giving, you know, extended terms to your customers. It's a way of using a working capital line of credit. Or if your um, your business is heavy on inventory, we working capital line of credit can be used to purchase inventory to help support the growth of your business, cover payroll, or just general um, seasonal expenses as well. Another type of uh, lending is working permanent working capital. This will be for more uh, fixed assets that you're looking to buy. You, you do not want to buy a, a vehicle under a line of credit. That is right. something that should be amortized. So permanent working permanent capital will be better used for that. For business improvements, a permanent working capital that will amortize is a better use of funds. We also do um, financing for purchasing of vehicles, purchase of equipment, we have leasing. Commercial real estate, if you're looking to buy your first owner-occupied property or investment property, we can always help you with that. We are a full service bank. Um, we have our SBA in-house, we're preferred SBA lenders. So even when you're coming to the bank and you feel like maybe there's a shortfall that maybe you can't get to there conventionally, we always turn to the SBA. We have our internal SBA reps that can help us, you know, determine if this is best suited with an SBA guarantee. So um, thank you all for having me here today. My, my contact information will be available to you and feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'll turn it over to Anna who will cover the next few slides. Great, thank you, Evis. Um, so um, as Evis was mentioning, um, we are a full service. Uh, sorry, there we go. I'm, I'm manning the uh, slides and presenting, so that becomes a challenge. Uh, we are a full service um, bank for small business. And um, in addition to all of the lending solutions, we have many different um, bank accounts and other services like payroll um, and, and other services that, that can support your business operations. Like TD, there are other banks out there that have the same types of service. Um, so uh, from a financial education perspective for you, what we want to underscore is um, that it's really helpful for you to sit down with a bank um, and have a very in-depth conversation and a broad conversation about all of the operations and the financial needs of your business because we can, as specialists, help you identify um, accounts, services, and other resources uh, that are going to help you uh, better manage your money and better manage the business. The business plan is really kind of the framework. Uh, from where we can launch those discussions because it allows us to get to know your thinking, to get to know how you've put your business together, where you plan to go with the business, um, and uh, we'll open up, uh, you know, avenues for additional questions and details that we can discuss with you to help you uh, meet your financial needs. So um, here at TD, I work in community development, and what I do is I manage relationships with public, private, and nonprofit partners in our markets that support our outreach to consumers and to small businesses. Um, so what I wanted to do was touch on a little bit of the resources that are available in the community uh, in addition to the SBDCs. Um, to help you uh, put together business plans, financial statements, and, and, and other technical assistance that's available uh, for a small business owner, whether you're starting or growing the business, 
or maybe branching out into a new venture. Um, one thing that I will mention to you is that um, in this series uh, that we're very happy that the SBA invited us to participate in, our first workshop last week uh, talked about financing options. And in that presentation, we talked about some alternative lenders that are available in the community. Um, many people think of just grants that are available to small business, but there's also um, additional alternative lenders, uh, mostly in the form of community development financial institutions or known as CDFIs. We have several here in Florida that are an alternative um, uh, lending uh, fund for a small business particularly if it's a minority or disadvantaged uh, business. And um, they can work with um, uh, borrowers that may not qualify for a conventional loan or are, are looking for a product uh, that does not really fit in the conventional um, uh, portfolio of most banks. Um, so the process that we follow here at TD is uh, that we meet with a prospective borrower, we talk about their needs, we identify uh, what their banking or lending needs are. Um, we go ahead and underwrite or make a decision on whether we're going to be able to provide a loan. If that's not possible through our own TD products, we look at SBA um, and we look to see if an SBA product is going to meet the needs of the individual and be more flexible. And then if that's not, um, uh, perhaps we still can't really reach what we need to to qualify a borrower we may contact an SB, uh, a CDFI or refer you to a CDFI so that you can talk to them about additional alternatives. Um, and this is particularly um, true in the case of uh, businesses that are just starting out and businesses that require much smaller microloans so for home-based businesses, for example. So let me talk to you a little bit about the business plan. Um, uh, in putting together a business plan, uh, you if you go to the SBA site, uh, you will see that there are templates uh, that you can follow. Um, but as uh, Bill mentioned, you know we have a very robust um, small business development center network here in Florida. Um, I believe that there's nine of them. Yes, I put it on the slide, so I'm right. <laughs> so nine uh, SBDCs across Florida. Uh, you can reach out to them for assistance. It's free of charge um, and they can refer you to additional professionals that that might be able to um, provide uh, more specialized assistance if that's necessary for your business or your industry. Uh, one of the partners uh, that we work with uh, across Florida is called Prospera USA. Uh, what Prospera does is it focuses specifically on his spec small business development. Uh, but they will work with any small business that comes to them for assistance. Uh, I know that EVs and other lenders uh, here in our Miami office um, often refer folks to Prospera when they need to put together a business plan, when they need to uh, formalize their financial statements. And uh, we have come to understand that many small businesses don't have kind of these basic uh, fundamental documents in place when they come to ask for financing. So we want to make sure that a business has gone through the process of all the thinking that goes into developing the business plan, looking at alternatives uh, for funding, uh, alternatives for business models, and are really familiar with the financial performance, their key performance indicators, as Bill mentioned, uh, for their business. Uh, this also comes in handy not only to request funding, but this are, these are key documents that a business uses to manage its operations, make sure that it's on track for performance, and also um, to evaluate you know, any kind of conditions that change in the market. For instance, next week we're going to talk about inflation and the impact of inflation on a business. If you have a, a good system of financial statements, it's very easy for you to kind of test your profitability by you know putting in a range of inflation that might uh, impact some of your production and um, and your inventory. Uh, so these documents are really important. Prospera can sit down with you as a business owner, go through uh, what you have in terms of your um, uh, management documents, uh, see where you need assistance. And as I mentioned, they're particularly focused on Hispanic owned businesses and for Hispanic owned businesses, uh, they have a fund um, that's supported by the state. 
uh, that can provide a grant to cover some professional services if you need a marketing expert or an accounting expert or something along those lines. Um, another partner that, that we work with um, very closely across Florida is the Black Business Investment Fund. Their mission is to develop and promote black business enterprises uh, across the state. And they have uh, a variety of loans that they offer as well. So Prospera focuses more on the technical assistance. BBIF does technical assistance, but is also a CDFI, one of those alternative lenders that I mentioned, that might be able to provide you um, uh, lending solutions if it is that we can't do it through the bank. Um, so BBIF, uh, in addition to having um, specialized loan programs that include lines of credits and, and term loans, um, as Evis was mentioning, they also are starting to focus on real estate development. So uh, minority contractors that are looking for lines of credits to do real estate development, um, it might be that BBIF is a good solution for you. So depending on the business owner, um, their, um, their perspective, the ownership of the company and the, and the specialty of their uh, business, we may refer them to a variety of different resources that we have in the market um, to provide them assistance. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that many counties and cities have an economic development department. Um, and through those, you can usually look them up online. Uh, they may have access to technical assistance as well, but this is where you'll find a lot of uh, support in the way of grants. And they also may have loan funds uh, specifically targeted to um, uh, very well-defined neighborhoods um, that they're looking to spur economic development within and job creation. Uh, so this is something that I would not overlook in terms of looking for resources to help you. Um, and we work very closely with cities and counties, if that is the case, um, to make sure that our, our clients are benefiting from all the resources that are available. Um, that's what I'm adding from the uh, economic development side at TD. Um, I think that we'll turn it back over to Bill and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. I, there, there is a there question is. in the chat. Uh, uh, Bill, this is for you. Where can I get a high quality data, in, uh, data including included for my business plan that will support my concept and assumptions? OK, that's a good question, CJ. And I guess what I would uh, say, there's a lot of different resources. Uh, there is some some data that's available at your local library that if you have have a library card in in your area you can access from home typically uh, census bureau which is available online a lot of times will have some good demographic information but um, to me and i guess i'm biased but i would say the best resource would be uh, contact your local sbdc um, we at the sbdc uh, and this this is true for all the uh, as Anna mentioned, you know, throughout the state, all nine regions have access to databases that the public typically does not have access uh, to uh, strictly because they're too expensive. Um, and you know, to access these reports would cost them thousands of dollars per report. Uh, because the SBDC has subscriptions to those services, we're able to access that data and provide it to you for use uh, in your business plan or whether you're looking at uh, just you know expanding to a new location, whatever the case might be. Uh, in our local region, and I think this is probably true in most of the other regions throughout the state, we have specific consultants who specialize in, in research and so get a hold of your local SBDC, tell them what you're looking for, and let them go to work uh, to help you get the, the research that you need. Thank you, Bill. Uh, one more question. What resources can I use to improve my credit rating so, so it's accept acceptable with uh, current lending uh, guidelines? Anyone? I'll let TD handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I can speak uh, on, on the personal side, right? Um, so uh, I, we focus a lot on, on the credit score when it comes to discussing credit, but one of the first steps that you need to take is to actually pull your credit report and see what's within the credit report. 
there might be mistaken information that you can correct. There might be um, mistaken accounts that have been um, uh, tied to your name or your social security number that are not yours. It may take a month or two to dispute some of these and to fix them. Um, but you know, when you pull the credit report, uh, what you want to focus on is uh, the number one driver of your credit score is going to be if you're making payments on time. So if you start paying your debts on time, uh, especially for the um, for the lenders that are reporting to your credit report, within six months you're going to start seeing your credit score improve. Um, if you have a very troubled account, it might make sense to just pay that account off completely and close the account, make a notation that you were the one that that asked for the account to be closed. All of these steps are going to start um, impacting your credit score and raising it over time. It does not happen from one day to the next. Um, the next thing that you want to make sure is uh, that if you have lines of credit open, and this is specifically related to credit cards, are you really using all of those credit cards? Because let me explain to you how a credit card is viewed from a credit perspective. If I have a $10,000 credit card, $10,000 limit on my credit card, and I only am using maybe a thousand of it each month, I still have the potential to owe $10,000. So you're balancing not using more than 20 or 30% of the credit that's available to you, but also not having many, many, many lines of credit that are open because that's potentially going to uh, mean that that your um, your capacity to repay other loans could be uh, infringed. So be selective about the credit cards and the and the lines of credit that you have open. Make sure that you're actually using them um, and then uh, work to maintain the the balance that's due on those cards and lines of credits to about maybe 20% of, of the available credit at any point in time. Um, those are some of the things that you can do uh, that I would say are the lower hanging fruit, as we say, the easier things. Remember, it's going to take some time. Also, if you go to an SBDC, if you go to um, Prospera or to BBIF, uh, there are other uh, financial coaching uh, resources that are available through United Ways, for example. Um, one of the things that you can do is sit down with a financial coach, go through the financial, uh, or I'm sorry, the credit report together and have them really help you based on their expertise, identify where there's problems in the credit report and what your strategy or your game plan should be to address those. Um, Evie, so I'll turn it over to you on the business side because I know there's also business credit considerations. Just like you know, the personal credit you know, report, um, you want to stay on top of it. You want to make sure that you're paying on time because your vendors are reporting you. You may not know that, but they do. Even Comcast, FPNL, on the business side, they report on how you're paying on time. Um, the other thing is inquiries. And I think I mentioned that in, in the previous you know, uh, slide. When you're out there or you're looking for credit, whether it is your furniture shopping or you're looking for a car, or you're trying to get financing, you know, for your business, pulling your credit and having those, you know, institutions look at your credit, you know, often that takes a significant toll on your credit score and it does go down and it doesn't come off easily. They stay on for like a year or more. So it just gradually comes off. So be mindful of when you're um, providing your credit, your social security pull credit that, you know, you're really, you know, it needed at the time. Otherwise, you know, refrain from pulling your credit too much and keeping your, I often see customers who have a significant amount of trade lines and every single trade line is at the limit. You know, they, there is no revolving availability. So while not having too much availability, is not good. Having not enough is also not good. So you kind of have to balance it all out, like you're saying, you know, make sure you're paying your creditors on time and that they're reporting you as, so, as such. And pull your business credit report as well. Pull it from Dun & Brad. So I think Experian even has a business credit report and review that and make sure that they are reporting you, you know, correctly. Because sometimes it, it isn't correct, but you know, there are measures that you have to go through to, you know, file your claim and dispute. But I tell customers, you know, um, credit, we're, we're in the United States. I know people come from different countries and they're not used to, they're usually paying everything in cash. 
And when I was great in their country here, everything is credit. So if you if you don't invest the time in cleaning up your credit now, it's only going to perpetuate and get worse if you know if you don't address it. So don't ignore it. Make it a priority. Thank you for that wonderful answers. Um, I think that was the last question that we had. Um, I also included in the chat, you can go to annualcreditreport.com for a free annual credit report. You could get one every three months from each individual uh, credit agency. Uh, so you'll have a credit report for the entire year. Uh, that's a good place to start. Take that report, uh, discuss it with a credit counselor, and uh, uh, you can dispute. Uh, if something's incorrect, sometimes they, they'll leave things in there that is negative, negatively affecting your credit and shouldn't be on there, either uh, due to uh, in, uh, errors or it can be just a time, uh, uh, a matter of time. If it's more than more than seven years and still on there, you could request a credit report uh, to be corrected that way. Um, I did present. I did put in in the chat our um, contact information. And I want to thank the presenters for just doing a fantastic job. Uh, I learned a couple of things, and I'm sure the audience uh, learned a lot more uh, than what they uh, anticipated getting out of this presentation. Thank you, uh, Bill. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Evie. You, did, you guys did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.